Did you know that the Lab you Experiment has a Patreon? All memberships include access to a private Discord server where you'll be able to chat with other fans. Benefits to membership include behind-the-scenes content and sneak peeks at new episodes, as well as opportunities to chat and even code with Sam. To learn more, check out our website, www.thelabviewexperiment.com. It's your contributions that keep our experiment going. Thanks. I was very defensive in the way I did things, mm -hmm. testing every possibility, testing it over and over again, because I knew that I had a reviewer that was going to really dig in when he took a look. Welcome to the LabVIEW experiment. I am your host, Sam Taggart from SAS Workshops. In my 15 years of working with and training developers, I've had the opportunity to conduct a lot of experiments. Over here, we believe in embracing failure as the essential learning experience that it is. And what better way to learn than from other people's mistakes? In this podcast, I talk to industry experts, colleagues, and friends about their failures and how they have turned them into future successes. Hi, uh, I am here today with Laura Miller. Laura currently works at JKI, but she and I have known each other for probably close to 15 years now. We both worked at Westinghouse way back in the day. And, uh, you know, she's done a whole lot of stuff since then. And I always thought she's a very good library programmer, but she's quite good, that programmer now. And uh, she also is uh, helping out with GDEVCon and A. She's on the board and helps out with that. So uh, thank you for joining us, Laura. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. I thought a very interesting theme for today's podcast, I thought, would be to just talk about the arc of a developer and how you know you grow and learn things over time and uh, talk about all the cool projects that you've worked on. Because I know we worked on some interesting stuff at Westinghouse and then after that you went on to do some other stuff. So yeah, you want to just start talking about that and we'll see where the conversation goes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the arc of a, of a LabVIEW developer. I, I've noticed, I mean, I'm sure you've noticed too a trend, a lot of electrical engineers kind of get started in LabVIEW. It's an easy, yeah. easy way to get started. And that was the same for me. Yeah. At Westinghouse, there were some test systems with Lab um, when I was an intern and I kind of got thrown onto those, luckily, and I just loved it. And as I was going through college, whenever it was time for our senior design project, I kind of pushed to use LabVIEW for that project, which was a flight simulator for this pilot, a local pilot in Butler who has a hydraulics company. So we, he connected the hydraulics to this, to the system and we used LabVIEW to control them. Is that what got you interested in flying or were you already a pilot at that point? I was, I've always been interested in flying. When I was younger, there's a, there's a pipeline close to my parents' house. And so on Saturdays, the pilot would fly really low over, over the fields close to the house. And, you know, just nice to watch the planes go by. Oh. So that's what started it for me. So when a, when a pilot came to our college asking for help making a flight simulator, I was on that project, you know, definitely I was volunteering for that. And I, I just reached out to him last year and he still has the simulator. I might go visit it, but. Oh, that's really cool. Is it still running like the original code that you wrote? Cause that's... I apparently in like LabVIEW 8 or something like that as a. See, that's really interesting because I'm part of this community called Legacy Code Rocks and they always talk about how like Legacy Code has this like bad reputation, but in that case, that's Legacy Code that's like still running and still functioning and like doing awesome stuff after all these years. So I think that's really cool. Yeah. I'm afraid to look at the block diagram, but I know that he's still using it. Can't remember exactly how we, how we did it, but uh, yeah, it was a desktop PC with, I think a PCI card and some analog outputs and digital inputs. And we were controlling hydraulic analog outputs, controlling analog outputs to control the hydraulics. And then reading in some encoders, rotary encoders to determine the position in like a feedback loop. So, and it was running on, the computer was running X-Plane. So as the, the pilot sitting in the middle of the simulator, you know, changes the pitch or the roll, those signals are sent to our LabVIEW program and that converts those into hydraulic inputs and voltage. Really interesting. Yeah. So... When we were, when we were testing it, it was fun. You know, when things weren't working quite right and you're riding the simulator and it's acting strangely because you haven't got everything figured out yet. Yeah. I was going to say, are there, are there safety requirements for that? Like, cause I, I imagine with the hydraulics, you could get up to some problems. Yeah. Funny story about that. We, 
he brought the system to the college and we were in the warehouse, you know, the electrical engineering professor found us a place to put this giant system to, to test out. And we were using it for a while. And then the, the college safety, you know, officer found us and was like, what are you guys doing out here in the warehouse? <laughs> so then we had some more safety, you know, caution tape and things like that, more procedural. Yeah, that's the one interesting thing about programming stuff in LabVIEW versus like other programming languages. I feel like other programming languages you're doing more like websites and data analysis and stuff. And and most of them, not all of them for sure, but most of them, there's not as severe consequences or the consequences that are severe, they're not as immediate. Like controlling high voltage power supplies or something or big actuators could be quite dangerous. Yeah, definitely. That's kind of the draw to, to using LabVIEW too is immediately you see results. And, you know, you have your hardware right there. It's very quick to get started. And you you see things moving and, yeah. Yeah, it's like the Raspberry Pi, like, blinking the LEDs and stuff and seeing things in the real world actually change as opposed to, like, I create a website or a database. Like, you know, th those are somewhat interesting and sometimes there's some cool challenges there. But, yeah, that just doesn't excite me as much. Yeah, me too. I mean, you have the same background as me, electrical engineering. I think we have that same, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, the database website stuff feels like the episode of Black Mirror where they're like all like rowing the bike or, or on the bike or something to generate like, you know, clothes for their as avatar or something. I'm like, you know, it's all made up imaginary stuff. Like I want to see something real that I can like tangibly touch, which is actually odd for an electrical engineer because electrical engineering is about a lot of stuff that you can't see. Yeah, that's very true. It was pointing out to me whenever I say that, but you can see the results sometimes, so... Yeah, my I mean, my career so far has been a lot of very hands-on, you know, using LabVIEW for testing or like at Westinghouse, we use LabVIEW for control systems and display systems in the operating room. So, yeah. yeah. I was always kind of impressed by you, actually, because like you do a lot of that hands-on stuff, but you don't, when it comes to writing code, you, you, your code, I remember what I saw would look really nice and neat and it was like very well engineered, as opposed to like a lot of times people are in that lab space. And to be a bit of hackers, you know, just throwing stuff together to try to make it work. Yeah, I mean, there's always that when you need to get something running really fast, you know. But there is something satisfying, too, about making everything look nice, like, you know, cleaning house. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that, that's definitely it. Yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, just having that nice, neat and tidy and be able to, like, just glance at it and know immediately what's going on. But that's one thing I think LabVIEW has over other programming languages. Like I can't just glance at Python code and like tell what's going on very easily. I have to like r read a lot more. Yeah, definitely. There's something to, to uh, this has come up a couple times for different projects, but you can almost write cl code too cleverly, you know, to the point where the next person has no idea what's going on. It's almost like, so I think about that now too. Like I could do something when you know when I'm writing a sub VI, I could do this really cleverly, and then the next person spends like 15 minutes trying to understand what I did, or I could just make it easy. So I think about that sometimes. It's a it's a balance. Python has a lot of that because it's amazing what you can do in one line of Python code. You can write a whole program in one line, but like nobody would ever figure out what the heck's going on. But yeah. but it's interesting because sometimes like. It's a balance because sometimes being concise is nice. Like, for example, Python, like, I, I don't know how much Python you're doing, but like list comprehensions, they can be nice when they're not too complicated, as opposed to writing out for each element in this list, do this transform, and then put it all back together versus just one line that says, take this list and do this thing to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes that is very satisfying, too. Yeah, it's it's like in a lab view, right? Like, if you have an array and you want to multiply the two array the arrays together... You can just run it right into it, multiply it, or you can run it through a for loop and el do element by element, right? And like, mm -hmm. obviously, just running them directly into the array is, is much nicer and cleaner, and it's yeah, it's just less things. Right. Yeah. yeah, that that's kind of where I. It's a weird arc, like as a developer, I think, because like when you start out, you don't know what you're doing, and then you kind of start to figure it out, and you learn all these rules, and then you become like the rule Nazi, like you know forcing everybody to follow all the rules. And then in the end, you like get to this point where you're just like, it just needs to be simple and work. And that's it. And that's all I care about. Right. Because yeah. I definitely, and I, and I was, I was totally guilty of this myself. I went through this phase where like, you learn this new thing, you learn about solid or object-oriented programming or whatever. 
and then everything has to be an object or everything has to be a DQH module or everything has to be an actor because you just like, you got this hammer and you're like, I'm just going to start whacking all these nails. But then you start whacking some screws too and you're like, yeah, that doesn't work quite so well. Yeah, that's really funny to think about. You know, when you're, when you've just learned like a new technology and you're almost obsessed, you know, over it, you know, you want to use it on everything. Yeah, Fabiola talks about code archaeology and going through old code and how it's evolved. And it's very true. You can look at old code and you can see like the stages of somebody's development because you can see like, oh, here's where they discovered events and here's where they discovered queues and here's where they discovered notifiers because they're just like littered throughout the code. And then they move on to the next thing and they learn something else and then they start using that everywhere. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Have you ever gone back and looked at some of your old code from years and years ago just for fun? Uh, I have not actually looked at too much of my old code. Yeah, the Westinghouse stuff, I left all that behind when I left Westinghouse. I have looked back a little bit. I have a few old repos of like some reuse code. Uh, but that's probably a bad example because I feel like reuse code is, is the one place that I go way out of my way to make it look extra nice and pretty and like cleaned up because I know other people are going to see it. Right. I think the real challenge is what does your code look like when you don't think anybody's going to see it? Right. <laughs> right. When it's just that like quick and dirty thing and you're just trying to push it out and... Right, yeah, the the thing that you were only going to use one time, and then you end up using over and over again. Yeah, yeah, that takes a lot of discipline. I have to say, there there was a phase, and maybe you went through this, where I was call myself a wire pusher, so where I was like so, super concerned about every wire can have any bends and moving stuff for like one pixel at a time, and I've just got so tired of that. Like especially when the the large monitors came out, it became really painful to do all those little manipulations. So I, I have to admit, I've been kind of lazy lately. I I quite often click on block diagonal and clean up for like smaller VIs. And if it looks halfway decent, I just let it go. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm not going to touch it. Obviously, that doesn't work for like big things. Like you got a DQMH module or some JKI state machine module and you hit that, it's going to like explode to like 20 screens or something. But... Oh, yeah. I very rarely use the block diagram cleanup. I'm really happy with the results. So I don't even try anymore. Well, I, I found when I started writing more object-oriented code, I had a lot of like accessors and like methods that just did one or two little things. And in that case, hitting black diagram cleanup, yeah, the wires weren't perfectly straight and everything wasn't aligned, but like it was so small and there was so few things going on that it wasn't that hard to figure it out. And I was just like, yeah, that's good enough. Right. At some point, I feel like there is a time trade-off. You know, and the other challenging thing I think I've run into is like dealing with inherited code because you inherit code and like maybe you have your style guide, but if the inherited code doesn't match your style guide, do you really go through like, you know, a thousand BIs and fix every one to match your style guide? Like that just seems like craziness. Right. So, yeah. I, I've, I've played around. I have a tool. I need to put it out there for, for doing BI analyzer and it just runs BI analyzer on the stuff that's changed. So it like looks through the Git history and pulls out what changed. Because like that too, that's another thing that you can waste a lot of time on because because via analyzer tests can take a long time to run too. Right. And they're totally your thumbs waiting for it to run and then you get a lot of noise. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. There have been some, you know, internal conversations at JKI about the best ways to, you know, style and enforcing style and convention and things like that and maybe using some DevOps tools to do that. You know. That's a similar so, VI scripting, yeah, things like that to enforce or do some light editing of VIs or, you know, a report on your system. A little bit different than VI Analyzer, but. That's a conversation I want to have with Jim because I discovered this tool in Python called Black. And I don't know if you've used it. Yeah. Basically, it like auto saves your thing, but it always saves it in the same format. Because mm -hmm. like one of the things, like, for example, in LabVIEW, like an annoying thing is if I have a VI and I scroll which case structure is visible in a case structure or which event structure or which event case is visible, and then I save it, now it counts as a change. And do I really care about that? And it shows up in all my diffs and stuff, and it would be really nice if, like, when I saved it, there was some scripting tool that just ran and just said, set everything back to zero and show case zero, regardless of how many cases there are. And they would just eliminate all that noise. Right. And there, there could be other settings, too, that, that you could do that. I think part of the problem is, like... There's a lot of individual style in LabVIEW and people have very strong opinions about style. And like, I think that the black tool is interesting because it's called black because it's from the Henry Ford quote, like you can have any color you want as long as it's black. 
So it's like, you don't get a choice. We're just going to auto format and this is what it's going to look like. And you're just going to accept it. And, but there is some freedom in that. Cause then you, like when I write Python code now, I don't, you know, I don't really worry about how many spaces I put in after like, you know, an equal sign or whatever. I just know it's going to get formatted correctly anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another fun thing about working at JKI is, you know, the heated discussions on style, you know, which which items to enforce and which ones to let go. Yeah, do they have a very strict style guideline or they give you guys some freedom or? A little bit of both. There are some some items that are, you know, inf you know we enforce, but yeah. other style issues that are arguments, it's just, yeah, it's very true that every LabVIEW developer has like a certain style and it may not be worth enforcing a very strict style for everybody because then you're just kind of throttling the people that don't fit that style so yeah. yeah that's something i've always like struggled with is like in allowing people to be individuals allowing them to make some decision have some autonomy on the things that don't matter and then enforcing the things that do matter right and, and also some of those style things like i think some of the style things you could make the argument that it matters because if i look at one piece of code and then I look at another one that looks completely different. Like there's that mental energy of like switching contexts that I think does have an effect when you're working in a group. So like, how do you balance all of that? And I find that's very tricky. Yeah, that's very true. And, and I just resent authority. So I hate being told what to do. So I hate like the really restrictive style guides. Like you must do this, you must do that. And it's all this like nitpicky stuff that's just like... Right, yeah, and then you're spending all your mental energy wondering whether you're meeting all of the style requirements while you're developing. Like, I'll pick on Fab really quickly because uh, she won't mind. Uh, she has like uh, this thing with like the arrow wire and it has to be in the back, and it's a, and it's such a uh, like I, it doesn't really bother me at all. But at least in her case, there she has like a VI analyzer tool that just does it for you, so it just fixes it. And it's like okay, and that's kind of along the lines of like the black thing. Like I just don't have to care about it. Right, it automatically gets fixed. So. Right. Yeah, there are some internal tools that different people are working on for like VI scripting, cleaning up the block diagram or things like that, changing things that to match the style guide. Definitely something I'm interested in. Yeah, so I can just focus on the functionality. <laughs> yeah, I like a style guide. Yeah, I would like VI Analyzer much better, I think, if that were the case, if I could just click and fix a lot of the cosmetic stuff. Like even if it required... Like, Honestly, it'd be nice if it just fixed it anyway, but even if it was like something controversial or something, I could just click a button and say, fix this, and I don't care about it anymore. Right. There's a lot of, there's a lot of energy in like manipulating those pixels and stuff and like, yeah. Right, exactly. Like some of the Python tools that are out there, analyzing the code and then, you know, offering you the option of whether, do you want me to fix this VI or do you just want to know that it's not meeting the requirements? And yeah, yeah let the let the tool fix your code for you or just know that you have a problem. Yeah, a lot of that comes down to like focusing your energy on the things that are most important, which are not the nitpicky things. It's the solving the customer's problem. So, right. Yeah. So to mention Fab again, the DQH actually has a nut ad. There's a validator tool that when you upgrade versions or something, if you make changes, you can run it. And it actually does a lot of the fixing. So it'll like, you know, say you have this change from one version to the other and you can just press a button and it fixes it and it's good. Oh, that's great. Yeah, most of the time, they have the button there because some of the things are destructive. And so, you know, you should use a little caution before you do it. But like moving wires around is like not destructive at all. Like, why can't they, why can't the tool, uh, the the analyzer tool just do that? So, so, so I, I have had some interesting thoughts lately about software engineering in LabVIEW. And I, I just feel like LabVIEW is a, a very difficult language to do software engineering in. I don't, I don't know if you feel the same way, but I feel like for like quick prototype lab stuff, it's really easy. And then when you want to use all these software engineering tools, just the fact that it's graphical makes it really hard. Or convincing software engineers to use LabVIEW. That's... Well, there is that too. But I think part of the resistance is though that they, like, they have these tool chains that work for text-based languages and then... I feel like if LabVIEW could just plug right into those and somehow work, that would overcome a little bit of their resistance. Yeah. I know I've been dabbling a little bit in, in Python and yeah, something like VS Code with all the extensions that are available for different languages. And yeah, it'd be nice if, if LabVIEW had the same support yeah. that all these other languages do. 
Yeah, I use PyCharm a lot for Python, and running unit tests in, in PyCharm is ridiculously fast. Like, I hit the keyboard shortcut before I even release it, it's already done. And in LabVIEW, I mean, I, I'm still using VI Tester, so maybe Karai or something is better. But I mean, I hit the button, I wait two or three seconds for the thing to load, and then it's got to go through and it shows me the progress on each one. And, you know, and it's at least 10 seconds to run tests versus like 100 milliseconds or something in Python. It's it's such a big difference. What are your, what are your thoughts on like the CICD using LabVIEW for automated builds and automated tests? I like the idea. I find it's flaky. So I've been having issues. I will pick on JKI a little bit because you're here. You can defend them. Now, I've had issues recently with VI Package Manager for some reason not letting you open from the command line. And it was driving me nuts. Eventually, I uninstalled it and reinstalled it. And I think that solved the problem. But but I've had problems with LabVIEW being flaky. I've had problems with cache getting corrupted. Like I'll run it on my machine and the code's there. I, I check it in. I push it. I look at Git like nothing, you know, everything's committed. And on the server, it fails and... You know, and then I go and clear the cache and this and that and restart LabVIEW and, oh, all of a sudden it works. And I'm like, that's just not. I don't know. Do you run into issues like that? Oh, fun LabVIEW issues. Yeah. Having to clear the cache or a project that is so big that it won't open until you open it in stages. I had that once. Yeah. Weird licensing things happen too. VIPM and LabVIEW have both done that where like the license runs out or something and, and you know, your build fails and you're like, why did it fail? And then you go and you're like, oh, there's a dialogue waiting for you to click OK or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like there ought to be easier ways. I keep saying and thinking that we should get LabVIEW running in Docker and be able to do all that. But then every time I have to troubleshoot something weird, I'm kind of glad it's not in Docker because it's in a, at least then it's in a virtual machine. I can like go into the GUI and look and see what's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. I know that Jim and Hunter have looked into that using Docker, Labby and Docker, and spinning up containers for for builds or running VI Tester, you know, on a on a runner. Yeah. So that's really interesting, and it's come up a lot. So I think that's the direction that a lot of people are going. Well, I, I like it because it starts fresh every time. You start with a fresh image versus the VM. You you end up I end up with all these residual things hanging around that then cause problems. So. And like provisioning machines too in the library world is kind of hard. Like in Python world and other world, they have like Ansible and these other tools. And I haven't seen anybody integrate that into lobby yet. So from managing dependencies and installing the right version of everything. I know Christian had talked about using NI package manager to do some of that. Mm -hmm. So I about like creating a dummy package that just lists like the library version, the, you know, whatever else and depends on all that. And so then when you install it, it just grabs that. Yeah. That's that's interesting that you mentioned that because the the things that um, JKI is working on, especially Jim with Dragon and package management are really exciting. So yeah, that does have to bring Jim back on to talk about Dragon. I don't know. But I, I will say like I've seen some demos and we've had internal, you know, lounge and learn conversations about it. And it's really cool what the direction it's going, like being able to handle package management. VIPM, NIPM. Oh, NIPM too. That's cool. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I'll be impressed. That's a, it is, it's very painful in LabVIEW. I mean, that's when I think about the most painful part of LabVIEW, it's commissioning a new system. Which packages do I need? Which LabVIEW yeah. packages, like NI packages do I need? Which drivers do I need? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and also, I have, for me, I have to set up three times because I have the deployed system, I have my development system, and then I have whatever the CI CD server is, and all three of those need to be uh, set up. And they need to stay in sync, too. That's the other part. Like, if I find I need a new version of the driver for something on the on the actual system, then I got to go update the other ones and make sure they're all the same, and, and that's problematic. Yeah. Yeah, being able to, you know, use the command line to you know, type a command and have your system up and running, you know, that would be great. Automatic. It's unusual for a LabVIEW developer. The most of the ones I've found are allergic to the command line. I'm learning. I'm talking about command line stuff, no, it's like, whoa, stay away. I'm learning. That that used to be me, but it is pretty nice to be able to type everything sometimes. Yeah, that totally used to be me too. And then I, I, I think part of it is like learning some of the little tricks, like the tab completion stuff and like go, going through the history and like, there's little tricks that you learn that make it a lot easier, I think. Yeah, there's definitely that barrier, you know, the 
if when you don't know what you don't know, you don't know all the different tricks and then it's, it takes a while to get started. But then once you do, like you said. This episode of the LabVIEW Experiment podcast is brought to you by Control 3. Control 3 is the magic fairy delay. The magic fairy delay inserts a wait millisecond delay into selected error wires because who has a whole second to wait? Try Control 3 today. Okay, so I got a question. Speaking command line stuff, forget to use the command line or do you use like source tree or something? I've used it all. Just recently, I started using the command line for basic things, which I'm not going to say that I'm an expert. <laughs> like if, if there's like a conflict, I'm back to GitHub desktop or source tree. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah conflicts are interesting. I don't think most people actually really understand how all that works. I think most of the time, most people are just guessing or they just grab ours or theirs and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? Do you use the command line? For a well, I, I almost exclusively use the command line nowadays. I think it's one of those things where like, I feel like the GUIs might make it easier, but the problem is when you run into problems that you'll almost always have to drop back to the command line. And so if you have to learn the command line anyway, I just find it's quicker and easier. So, yeah, you know, but yeah, it definitely is an acquired case and it, it does take a little practice and, and there is a tiny bit of memorization, which is like, you know, cause one of the great things about a GUI is like, you don't have to memorize the buttons there and you just go click, you know, I mean, you still have to know where to click, but like, you know, it's more discoverable. I feel like command line stuff is often not very discoverable. Right. Yeah. I'd agree with that. I was playing with some command line tool the other day and I forget which one it was. And it's actually very discoverable and you could like type in a command and, and hit, oh, it was, uh, there's a tool called GLAB, GLAB. It's GitLab. It's like a command line tool for, for interacting with GitLab. And it's totally discoverable. You hit GLAB and then lit, and you hit enter and it doesn't do anything. It just lists all the commands and you type the next one, you hit enter and it says, oh, here's all the sub commands and you can just go down the list and it's really nice. But I like it because for my workflow, I, I always have the, the GitLab or the Git command line open and I have lab you open and when I'm doing stuff with GitLab then I have to have a GitLab browser window open so I can add issues and all that and I, I like being able to just add issues from the command line so I can be like hey take you know show me all the issues okay I'm grabbing this issue make, mark that one as in progress and then start working on it and then when I'm done I just mark it closed and I don't have to open up the browser so I realize this lab you people are probably looking at me like I have four heads right now or something but I was just thinking, how often do you run into customers that haven't implemented any sort of source code control yet? I still get them all the time. Yeah. I mean, this it's is like a... I got several, so... Really, yeah? Well, I... Pretty common. Yeah, no, I got one... This woman inherited a uh, thing that had several projects, and they were all in one folder on a share drive, and they were all cross-linked to each other. You know, the reuse was like, we have this folder and here it is. And both projects pull from it. And that's great. Except that what happens when this project needs to modify that common thing and this one doesn't need that modification and how the heck do you track that? And yeah. That that sounds very similar to one of the projects that I worked on it and sold it. Well, Hitachi now. But yeah, that was source code control. It was a network drive. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and then the drive goes down and causes problems and, and you know, there's no contention like if two people are writing it at the same time what the heck happens who knows right whichever one saves it first i guess i don't really know yeah Open on each other's chain i mean even with source code control like at westinghouse like we for the longest time like every time when we were using subversion with eric and those guys and the other people in our group were constantly stomping on my changes because i uh, you know i submitted a change they 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 go to submit something and there'd be a conflict and they just say choose mine and then my changes are gone. And I'm looking at it like a few weeks later. I'm like, I swear I fixed that bug and I changed it and it's gone. And I go back looking through the history and yep, yeah, there it is. And then there's their change stopped all over it. That'd be so frustrating. <laughs> like, I don't think you know how to use the tool very well. Yeah. I was, I was lucky for a long time at Westinghouse. I was the only developer in our little group. So I was using SBN for myself. <laughs> I, I learned how to code very defensively at Westinghouse. I don't know if you remember the... The guy, I'm not going to say his name, but he worked for the people up in Connecticut. The guy, you know what I'm talking about? Well, there are several people who worked for the ones up in Connecticut. And there were these three of them. And one of them was really a good guy. I liked him. The other two were kind of crazy. 
But yeah, there was one guy like I we we butted heads all the time. So, so you had to code defensively. Yeah, no, it was definitely because like I knew like if I, because like, you know you if you if you trust the source of the inputs to your code, you don't have to do as much range checking and stuff, and you can you don't have to like you have to account for every possibility. So I used to code like super defensively, do all this range checking and input validation and stuff, and my code would be like super complicated. And then Eric saw me and come on, like, no, you don't need this, you don't need that, this, you know, and it would, it would be much simpler and easier to read. But I just kind of assumed that everybody else was trying to sabotage everything. So, which is I not mean, a team dynamic, by the way. No, probably not. No. But I mean, I'm glad that I had the experience of working with, with Tim at Westinghouse because we worked pretty well together, but he would test, you know, test what I, what I did. You know, very robustly. So I, it was almost like what you're saying. I, I was very defensive in the way I did things, testing every possibility, testing it over and over again, because I knew that I had a reviewer that was going to really dig in when he took a look. Yeah. Well, actually, I, I'm kind of back to testing everything, though, but not I'm necessarily paranoia, but I, I, I'm really a big fan of TDD. So I start writing tests first, and, and I feel like that's I feel like that's a much better way to write code. I, I almost can't do it without it now. So, uh, but yeah. yeah. I've heard some conversations about it, test-driven development. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will say, Wesley, I was, well, once it was just me and Eric. Eric and I got along really well, and Eric was Eric's, Eric was pretty awesome. I, I'm yeah, definitely. sad that he's no longer doing LabVIEW. He moved on. He's doing something else now, I think. See, here's Plus Plus, or I don't remember. But he also was the one that introduced me to Agile and doing, I mean, we were doing scrum or at least that's what we called it i don't know i don't know that any of us eric probably knew more about it than any of us i just kind of followed his lead but we definitely had the burn down charts going and we had our daily stand-ups and all that and yeah which actually is really hard to implement in a place like westinghouse because they were very top-down waterfall control. yeah I, I literally remember sitting in design reviews there where the project's almost over and they've and we're like, you bought the wrong hardware. And they're like, sorry, we have to keep going. And it was like, you know, it was almost like saying, you know, we're in Colorado. We want to go to New York. We're running west. And we, we've just gone so far, we can't turn around now. We just got to keep going. And you're like, but you're not going to get where you want to go. Well, but the requirements documentation was pristine, right? All the documentation was <laughs> reviewed. That was the other problem with that system because we were always on the end. We were on like the testing end. So mm -hmm. like the the requirements always took way longer to gather than it was supposed to. Then building it always took way longer than it was supposed to. And then the test came and they never allocated enough time to begin with. But then all that time got compressed because the end deadline never moved. That was always crazy. Yeah, that was my experience too. Yeah, by the way, the schedule is now compressed. You need to complete your test in like two days instead of two weeks. Do, do you remember, speaking of testing, do you remember the board testing system? That was a quite interesting system. Yes, that was... Did you ever look at the source code for that? I think, was it Merle? I think he may have shown me, shown me that once or twice. It was both. It was amazing. It was horrible at the same time. Like, as a system, it was actually kind of well-designed in that you could change out the fixtures and put in different boards and, like, that all was well-designed. The software as a whole was, was also both horrifying and amazing at the same time in that Merle actually understood how it worked, but... Like it was like the thing was like a stacked sequence structure, seventeen frames deep or something, to initialize all the global variables and stuff, and it was crazy. But I, I will give him one piece of slack, and that is a lot of the stuff that he did, a lot of the code was was kind of convoluted because they didn't have certain features. Like for example, there was a screen, and I don't think it was Wabbits. I think this was on BMIMS, but they had twenty four graphs for twenty four different channels, and they wanted to set like background color or something, right? Well, you could get an array of all the references and pass them into a for loop, except that you couldn't get, do control references in like lab year four or five. So you literally had a for loop and you had to tell it, oh, there's 24 of them. And in each one, you had to have a directly linked property node to set the graph, which is just wow. crazy. And then like, you know, you decide you want to set some other property. Well, you got to go to all 24 and expand it down and select the right one. And it was not very scalable. What, what version of lab view did that start in? Do you know, was it? Lab before? I want to say when I started, it was 15 years old. So I would have started in like 1992. So whatever was there, 
And when I started working out in 2007, it was in Lab U 6, 6.0 or 6i or, or something like that. So it might have been Lab U 7. It was either Lab U 6 or Lab U 7. I remember doing a lot of work in Lab U. So there was DMIMS and there was Wabbits. And I think Wabbits might have been in Lab U 7 and DMIMS was in Lab U 6 or something like that. But yeah, they yeah, so I mean they've been upgraded a few times and you know, yeah. That and lots of add-ons and but the DMIMS thing actually taught me a lot about project management and managing my work and stuff too, because there was a guy up in Windsor, that's a place in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And like I don't know if you remember John Smith. Yes, I just yeah, character, you can't forget him. But he and this other guy in Windsor were constantly butting heads. And so we'd have a meeting and one of them would say, Hey, go do this. And I'd go do it. And then the other, we'd have another meeting. They would be like, why'd you do this? Go change it back. And it would just come back and forth. And like, and, and at that point, like we were very new to the whole issue tracking thing. And like Eric had set up Bugzilla, but this guy in Windsor would constantly call me on the phone and want me to do stuff. And I'm like, I'm not doing it unless you put it in writing. I was like, cause then somebody's going to yell at me. Like, why did you do this? I was like, you need to like send an email and enter it in the bug tracking system. And right. Document it. Yeah, yeah, having a little bit of a paper trail. I mean, I don't know that you need to be like overly prescriptive. Like, I don't know that you need like, you know, mound, mountains of Jira tickets or something, but having just an issue tracker and just having some way of keeping track of that's really a good idea. You, you reminded me when we were talking about older versions of LabVIEW and upgrading. We ran into a fun issue when we upgraded from a LabVIEW 6 system to like LabVIEW 10. Or the, I guess in older versions of LabVIEW, some, if you opened a visa reference and forgot about it, it would handle it for you. <laughs> or at least it didn't matter in, you know, maybe in Windows XP or something. But when we upgraded, now we had this, we ran out of memory over and over again because there were all the old code would open up like a serial port and then not close it <laughs> just over and over again. So it's just interesting, like the older versions of LabVIEW handled references differently, like you said. Yeah, there's actually a setting in the properties window, probably to maintain compatibility with older code. But if you go into LabVIEW options, there is a thing to like close Visa references automatically or something. So that's probably where that came from. Right, yeah. <laughs> but the other thing with migrating old code is when you go back too far, you you hit that pre-DACMX days. And that's just kind of painful because the old DAC stuff is kind of a mess. Like DACMX is like a huge step forward because in the old days there was like, different BIs for everything and they all had different connector panes and different, like there was no unified interface. Mm -hmm. Now, Yeah, so or, or error, or error wires. I think that was for LabVIEW 8, right? The error cluster. Oh, did they not have error clusters? Okay, maybe I missed that part. Well, I've always wanted to be more involved in the LabVIEW community, but it's, it's difficult when it's not part of your job description, you know? Yeah. And it's hard to justify to a manager, you know, the time in user groups or conferences or things like that. So I'm excited to be more involved now. And also really cool how JKI is all about the LabVIEW community. So it's very supportive at JKI to, you know, make open source packages and go to conferences and be involved. So this is great. I mean, I when I went to my first CLA conference, I had to pay out of my pocket to go, you know. Oh, wow. Um, so this is obviously a 180 from that, you know, very supportive. Yeah. And Jim has to be way more supportive than Westinghouse for sure. Although I remember when I was at Westinghouse, they did send me to NI week a couple times, but usually it was, I had to justify it. So there had to be some session or something that I wanted to see that was right. Related. Yeah. I think. yeah. Did you go to any of the NI weeks when I went with Jim and Sabrina and them? No, I don't think you did. No. Yeah, the same same thing. I think Westinghouse only had so much budget and you have to be a presenter. So yeah. were, were you around when Evan Robinson was around? Does that name ring a bell? Very briefly at the beginning of my career at Westinghouse, I remember him and then Yeah, we had a Western Pennsylvania Lab users group that was actually semi active and then it just kind of fell apart when he left. And I think the next guy was Ismail or something and he he was good. He did he tried to do some stuff. I don't think the user group survived. There's also a me. DSA is it DSA is that the company that's out there yeah right yeah that you're driving a lot of that for a while and with Rich and where the other people were that work for him there's a whole bunch of them mm -hmm. yeah they were like the training center the Westinghouse user group was great yeah 
Yeah. I think I probably started that and then I left or something like that. Well, it continued on for a while after you left. I mean, until I left, I think. Well, the bankruptcy made things a little strange, but yeah, it was great to have meetings and talk about, you know, as we were still a little bit siloed, I think, but it was better with the user group. Yeah. In general, we were kind of siloed, although you were down in Newstand and I would go down there a lot. So you and I and, and Tim, we kind of like cross pollinated a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I had a couple of discussions at my other job about a user group and it was really hard. You know, there's a lot of resistance. Basically, you have to do user group meetings over everybody's lunch and, and nobody wants to spend their lunch break working technically, you know. So sometimes you you meet some resistance trying to generate those user groups. Yeah, I never really understood that resistance to like people training and getting better because like as a business owner, like I want my people to be well trained and know what they're doing. And if it takes an hour away from doing the work, like it's like it's like the classic thing of the guy standing there like chopping down the tree with the dull axe and the guy's like, well, why don't you show up? And he, I'm too busy chopping down the tree. Yeah. <laughs> or, or like the guy pulling the cart with the square wheels, like, hey, I got this idea. And they're like, nope, we're, we're too busy. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, you know, and then you have the situation where you find out that a group and another department is basically writing the same lab you code that you are, but you don't even know that they exist. <laughs> yeah, that definitely happened at Westinghouse. That happens a lot, actually. So I, I did a training for a company the other day, and like they definitely had that going on. They had a whole bunch of people throughout the company doing lab, and they had no idea. And I think I'm going to put this on NI a little bit. I think NI could do a better job of connecting those people because NI has got to have the list. Right. They got to have a list of like, here's the hundred people at this company that are doing LabVIEW. So you're not, I mean, maybe, I know there's like privacy concerns and all, but I think since they all work for the same company, you could at least like, you know, do something. But Yeah. I mean, that's the sales manager for the Pittsburgh region helped me out with that. Actually, when I was at Hitachi, I asked, do you know who all the LabVIEW users are in this building? And he got back to me with the list of emails. And that was actually very helpful. Like my own manager didn't know that information, but NI Sales was able to like tell me who is using LabVIEW in my building. Yeah, even if it, I couldn't like give out the list, like you could send them an email and say, "Hey, we're having a meeting this day. Can you just send it out to everybody?" And like they show up, great. You're like, and then right. I can go from there. Yeah, right. Yeah, I I don't know. There's there's a lot that I don't understand about how NI does stuff. So we'll we'll just leave it at that. I think. Well, I mean, maybe maybe things are turning around. Yeah, I do think there are some good things on the horizon. So I, I have to try, I'm trying to be more positive and give them a credit where it's due. So, I mean, they did, they've got Lyle doing the partner stuff and he's doing a really good job. And I think he just got promoted to some other, or moved laterally or something. And they've got another guy in there now that's doing really good. And they've got Nancy doing the user group stuff and the community stuff. And I think she was a great choice. So yeah, she's great. Yeah, I do have to say, that's one thing I always admire about Jim. He's always very positive. So... Yeah. He's not afraid to like call Hanai to task, but he's also like, when he does, it's like very clear. It's like very, here's this exact problem and here's a possible solution or here's what I think we should do. And mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. It, it's really great to just be in the room, you know, at JKI and, and hear those conversations and, you know, Jim basically pushing the boundaries of LabVIEW and like innovating in LabVIEW and like you said, kind of calling Hanai to task a little bit on mm -hmm. what could be better. Yeah, yeah, there are definitely some areas that could be better. I don't know. We'll we'll see what happens. I I am cautiously optimistic about the future. So, well, I can say from from my perspective at JKI, there are some exciting things coming. So, I mean, I hope it's good. Actually, yeah, but that's really good. Yeah, I'm. Oh, I keep thinking that they need to have better support for software engineering stuff, and it does seem like a lot of the stuff that Jim has been pushing is a step in that direction. So. Right. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm just like greedy or capricious or something. I always want more. I, I would love for LabVIEW to be like on par with Python and some of these other programming languages. And yeah, maybe asking a bit much of NI because there are some definite challenges there. But yeah. No, that would be That's great. What I mean, vision is of, of what it could be, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think, well, for me, having the LabVIEW community editions out, that's, I think that's huge. You have some. You know, the hobbyists or people can download LabVIEW at home and use it and play with it. And that might help too, you know, just as yeah. easy as get Python, you can get LabVIEW. 
yeah, that is a huge step in the right direction. I mean, there's there's still some friction there. Like you still have to create an NI account and you have to license it. And there's some, and, and I'm not, honestly, I'm not quite sure. Like, I'm sure there's a reason for that, but that just seems like, it, it would seem like they could remove some of those frictions and make it even easier. But I, I am happy that they at least, there now there is a free option. So, right. so that is definitely a good thing. That was definitely needed. So I think that was one of the hurdles to the LabVIEW open source community, having open source projects and having people contribute. I think the other one, and Jim has been on about this, and I think it's a, a good one, is the version compatibility issues. Right. For example, at one point, like a year or two ago, I wanted to contribute to Karaya, and I looked at it, and it was written in LabVIEW 2013. And I don't have a copy of LabVIEW 2013 sitting around, so I would have to go create a virtual machine, install it, do all that just to be able to contribute to this project. And it's like, you know, do I really want to spend time and energy and effort doing that? Like, it'd be really nice. Like, for example, in Python, like the editor doesn't care what version the code is. Right. But, and maybe that's part of the problem, but it's like the LabVIEW editor and the compiler are one and the same. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what it would take to separate those or if it's even possible, but if you could separate those two, then you can have an editor and edit it. And then the compiler runs in the background and, if the code's in 2017, you load the 2017 compiler. If it's in 2019, you load the 2019 compiler. And I, I think part of the problem is you need to load the correct set of palettes and all that. And, and and that's part of the challenge. Whereas like for Python, like it's all text. So you can type in whatever the heck you want. And as long as you don't use a construct that's that's not recognized by the compiler, you're fine. Right. I know there were some conversations about like GWeb development or NXG, like the, the source code being basically text files, you know, readable, mm -hmm. readable. And then there was that really cool project that Derek and Jim did, the Pico G, basically yeah. exporting G-Web development to Raspberry Pi Pico because the files can be interpreted. Yep. And, you know. Yeah. There, there, so the thing with the NXG, my understanding is it was somewhat, like it was it was text based, is like XML or something, but maybe there's some binary stuff. And there was something about like you couldn't just do a normal diff and merge. Like it just didn't. Stephen Mercer explained it, or Loftus Mercer explained it. And he's like, yeah, he's way smarter than I will ever be. And he explained it. And it, it made sense when he explained it, but I don't know that I could explain it. But it had something to do with the fact that like there's too many dimensions of freedom because it's like a two dimensional thing as opposed to like a one dimensional text thing. And it just, I don't know. Yeah. He said it was too difficult. And basically, he said it was like an intractable problem. So hmm. I don't know. Sounds like a challenge. Is that, I, I, you know, I know for sure I'm not going to figure it out. So I'm not going to be the one to, to fix that problem. I'm, I'm sure that there are quite a few smart people thinking about this, the problem that you identified, being able to open in different versions. I mean, that's a common pain point for LabVIEW and yeah. open source. And yeah. I thought Jim has some program to like back save stuff. I don't know if it was back. He had some project he had, and I forget what it was. Maybe you know more about this. He had some project for that, and I think was it back saving various versions or something. I'm not sure. Okay. I know when you build PPLs, you can open them in newer versions of Labby when they're compiled. Yeah, that was a huge step forward. Yeah. You had a you had a VI opener open in the correct version of LabVIEW when we were at Westinghouse. Yeah. Right, cool. yeah, so I had the one that I built for Westinghouse, and then when I left, I actually created one. It's on the LabVIEW tools network, but it's it's weird because it's this tool that I built, and I don't use it at all anymore. Because now I just do virtual machines for everything because it's so much easier. Right. Yeah, it's a little bit dangerous to have multiple versions on the same machine. Yes, that is a problem. But it's funny you mentioned that because somebody was mentioning that problem the other day and I pointed them to that tool and that's the first time I've thought about that tool in a couple of years. So, yeah. Cool. All right, Laura. Well, it's been great talking to you. We are kind of wrapping up. I do have one question though I want to ask before we go and that is in the name, in the in the vein of, you know, this is a lab you experiment. We're talking about experimenting and trying things. Can you talk about a time that you tried something and it didn't work out the way you thought it would? Yeah, definitely. When you say that, something that comes to mind is kind of a combination of hardware and, and LabVIEW going through EMI EMC testing with LabVIEW systems, which really doesn't have, it's not really specific to LabVIEW or NI, but basically we were, we had our system, we needed to get it certified 
and we're trying to meet these standards, which include the system has to demonstrate that it works while it's under test. So you're injecting these pulses, the RF signals, you know, and the system still has to work. So the way we demonstrate that is we run our lab use simulator at the same time, which is just this PXI system with a bunch of analog and digital IO. And we're, we're failing our EMC test. And we come to find out that this LabVIEW PXI simulator that we had thrown together very quickly, which is like the beauty of NI, we didn't have any signal conditioning or any shielding on it. And the ground, the chassis ground is connected to signal ground. So basically our, our PXI was causing us, our simulator system that was thrown together really quickly was causing us to fail our test. Ah. So what I, you know, what we learned from that, you know, through a lot of pain, weeks of using multimeters and oscopes to understand the problem is to understand the ground scheme of your system, the grounding scheme, especially when using like a PXI. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very important. Basically the, the ground reference of the signal. So there are things you can do to fix that, you know, you know, electrically you can add a shielding or um, ferrite and things like that capacitors to make it better. It's just that we had made, created the simulator very quickly and did not take any of that into account. So. Yeah, I think that's kind of what separates LabVIEW developers from uh, other developers is that that knowledge of like the signals and systems and like and the electrical part of it and like starting at that base level of, because I mean, if you're developing websites or databases, you don't really need to know about that. And that's right, fine. Yeah. But for the systems that we do, that, that little bit of, I mean, it's not even necessarily domain knowledge because it's kind of independent of the domain, but just that, that basic knowledge of like, even little things like uh, sampling frequency and the Nyquist theorem and all that stuff, like you, you have to have some basic understanding of that. So, yeah, definitely. So many LabVIEW systems are very, you know, very hardware based, and so it's important to understand all those concepts. Definitely. Great. No, that's a great example. Thank you very much, Laura. All right, I think we're gonna close this down now because I'm gonna interview Hunter in a few minutes, so I want to have a few minutes to prepare. But I could go on talking to you forever. You are one of my favorite people. I really much enjoy talking to you. So, yeah, you are, you are one of mine too. Thanks for pulling me into this LabVIEW community. You know, yeah, I really appreciate it, and it's really exciting to be here. So, all right, great, thank you. Yep, thank you. That's it for today's episode of the LabVIEW Experiment. Thanks for listening. If you have any comments or questions, head over to thelabviewexperiment.com and drop me a note. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the LV Experiment.